I want to do start off with just a quick review of confidence intervals for a numerical variable and confidence intervals for a proportion. Okay, so that we have we really covered it during the past review session, so you should should listen to that probably. Uh, but just quickly to get us kind of like back on the same track again before we move on to the t-test. So let's say that we have a uh, situation where we know that um, uh, 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 in a certain uh, 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 in public schools that the uh, the performance average performance of students out of public schools um, um, uh, ordinary public school on a standardized test is a score of uh, say 250. Okay, now let's say that uh, we want to compare the, and that, that's, uh, that we've measured every public school, um, uh, uh, every student in public school, there was a uh, money to do, to survey it almost like a, um, a census. Uh, every student got tested. However, we didn't, we didn't test private schools. Okay, and we want to know, um, is the performance on that standardized test for private schools the same or different than it is for public schools? Okay, well, one of the things that I might do is I might go to these public schools if I don't have a, uh, uh, the funding to do a, uh, a survey of every student, I may have every student take the test, I may randomly select, let's say I randomly select 25 students. Okay, so we randomly select 25 students from Private, uh, private schools in the same geographic areas as, as this public school, there really are thousands of students. So this is just a sample, a small sample of those thousand people. Okay, so now uh, what I can say to myself now is I say, okay, well, what was the mean of that sample? The mean of that sample, as it turned out, came out to be 260. Okay, so at this stage now, we'd like to know, well, how does this compare? How does the mean for private schools, mu, for all private schools. We know mu for public schools. We don't know mu for private schools. How does that compare to public schools? What is the mean for all of the students in public schools? Well, we're never gonna know that because we're only gonna be able to take a sample. So all we're gonna know is X bar. So at best, what we can wind up with is an idea of what the likely range is based on our sample. Well, we know what the mean is from our sample, but we don't know what the variability is. If we knew what the variability of this entire population was, was sigma, if we knew what that was, we would be using the Z table to calculate uh, confidence intervals. But most of the time, you're not gonna know that. You're only gonna know the standard deviation for those 25 people. Okay, so 25 students. So let's say the standard deviations for those 25 students was, uh, let's say it was, uh, make up a number here, uh, uh, let's say it was 15, okay, standard deviation was 15, okay, so the standard deviation of these 25 students approximates the standard deviation for the population, just like the mean X bar approximates the mean for the population, that's why we take samples, they give us a window on the population, so, so at this point, I'm going to say to myself, okay, let's calculate a confidence interval for this mean. What's con how do we calculate confidence in interval? X bar plus or minus, and we use either Z or T. We use Z when we know the population standard deviation. So if I told you at the start of this problem that even though we didn't know the mean of the private school uh, population, that, I, you know, be, based on other very big surveys or studies or or previous years, we knew what sigma was, uh, then I would use Z for say a 95% confidence interval. And Z would be equal to 1.96 for 95%. We also know for 90%, it would be 1.64. And for 99%, it would be 2.58. Can we get that from our Z table? Okay, so for Z, for alpha is equal to 0.05, or alpha over two is equal to 0.025, half of that. Right, for alpha, alpha is the uh, amount of error that we're willing to accept. So 95% confidence basically is kind of like saying 5%, except you would accept 5% chance of error, right? So that would be your alpha error, right? So at any rate, so uh, in this case, we don't know what sigma is. So we have to use the, we have to use the T score instead of Z 
and uh, and we have to use the standard deviation to calculate our standard error, right? So we're going to calculate our confidence interval x bar plus or minus t in this case times the standard error for repeated sample sizes of size 25. But one standard error is equal to sigma over the square root of n, and in this case it's over the, equal to standard deviation over the square root of n because we don't know sigma. So it's gonna be equal to 15 over the square root of n, 25 is five. So standard error is equal to three. So our confidence interval is gonna be x bar plus or minus the T score for our 95% confidence interval, alpha equals 0.05, right? Times standard error, which is equal to three. So what is T equal to in this case? Well, T, has to be a larger number than z because it has to give us a wider interval because we have an added level of uncertainty about the variability of the uh, population because we don't know it we don't know the population standard deviation we're only estimating it from a relatively small sample so let's go ahead and i'm going to go ahead and search for that i'll get my t table A lot more detail. Uh, yes, the last night, uh, uh, when was when was it? I forget what it was. Was it uh, yesterday morning? Right. Went went through this in a lot more detail. So if you have problems with this, you should you should listen to that uh, video. Okay. Here we go. Here's the t table, and I'm going to look up our t table for now. T table gives us the values that we're going to use instead of z. So for instance, for a 95% confidence interval, 95% confidence, right? We're gonna use this middle column. If we were looking for 99%, we'd use this column. And if we're looking for 90%, we'd use this column. If you go down to the bottom, you notice 1.64, 1.96, and 2.58 are the values you would use if, we're, if you knew the population standard deviation. In other words, you had an infinite number uh you had the entire population as your sample set right but anything anything below that anything below having the entire population as the sample size gets smaller the t value gets larger because it has to make up for more and more uncertainty about the variability so let's see what it is for a sample size of 15. well we're actually looking up the degrees of freedom which is uh, i'm sorry 25 degrees of freedom for for 25 minus one is the number of degrees of freedom, sample size minus one is degrees of freedom, right? So that would be 24 degrees of freedom. And the sample and the T score we would use for 95% confidence interval is 2.064. Okay, so I'm gonna use that here. So it's gonna be uh, our confidence interval, it's gonna be equal to our mean, 260. Remember X bar uh, uh, would be mu if we knew the population standard deviation, the population uh, mean. Uh, we use 260 for sample uh, uh, mean. We use X bar for the sample mean. 260 plus or minus 2.064 times our standard error, which we calculated from standard deviation, times three. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, see if I can get my calculator out and give this a try. So I'll clear everything. And I'm going to go 2.064, oops, 2.064 times 3 is, oh, no, I messed up here. Try this again, 2.064 times 3 is equal to 6.192. That's our margin of error. That's called our margin of error. That's what we're going to add and subtract to 260. I'm going to store that in memory. And I'm going to clear it out here. So I'm going to take 260 minus that uh, uh, so margin of error. And that's going to be equal to 2. margin of error. It's going to be 
oops, I just uh, it should be plus 260 plus our margin of error, which is 266.2, I'll call it 266.2. So we're 95% confident that the true mean of scores for this, for this, uh, 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 for private schools, the true mean for the entire population of private schools is between 253.8 and 266.2. Well, you know, let's see, if the public school score mean was 250, well, that's outside of our confidence range, right? That's 253 to 266, right? And public school, the known mean is 250. Well, it kind of suggests that we're also 95% sure that there's, that there's a difference between the mean, true mean for private schools and the true mean for public schools, right? Now, had our standard, had our variability been greater, right? We might not have been able to prove that. For instance, if our standard uh, standard deviation had been, uh, uh, let's say, 25, then our standard error would have been five, two times five would have been, would have been uh, 10. We, we, we would have, uh, uh, 250 would have been with uh, inside of our confidence interval instead. So we wouldn't have been, we would have been 95% certain that it was different. We really don't, we use that all, we use that kind of criteria only when we're talking kind of about single sample texts. We're not gonna use that when we talk about uh, two sample tests. When we have two sample means and we're comparing them. That's what we come across most, most frequently. Uh, we're gonna exclusively talk about using specialized tests comparing means of two groups, one of which we're going to demonstrate here, which is called the t-test. We're going to use the t-test for single samples. We should get kind of the same result as we got here. So how do we do a t-test here? Well, the way that we do a t-test is we say to ourselves, okay, let's take a look at how far apart that these two means are, the 250, and how far apart is that from 260? Is it enough standard errors apart? Is it enough standard errors apart? Are they far enough apart for the number of standard errors, standard deviations for samples? Are they far enough apart for me to say with less than 5% chance of being wrong that they are different from one another? Those two means. Well, the way that we do this, we calculate a t-test. We actually calculate a specific t-score. So the first thing I might want to look up is I might want to look up what is the value of t that I would need in order to be able to say with less than five percent chance, uh, less than five percent chance, that these two, that that number of standard errors apart, that t score, number c score, t score represent number of standard errors or standard deviations apart. Uh, uh, what t score would I need? How big would that t score have to be to be able to say there's less than 5% chance that I would get that extreme a difference between these two means, uh, uh, that number of standard errors of difference between these two means, uh, that it would occur less than 5% of the time. Okay, so let me think about that. Let's see. Okay, so the t-score that I would need, that critical value of t, that, that, that is the same value that we just looked up for a confidence interval. So in other words, for a sample size of 25, we need to, a 20, uh, 24 degrees of freedom, we need to have a t-score difference in the number of standard errors between the two means, that's the population mean that we're comparing it to and our sample mean uh, for the other population. We would need at least that big a t-score. Bigger is better. If we're above that, we know there's less than 5% chance we would get that big a difference if they came from populations with the same population mean. Right, so 2.064 is our critical value of T. T critical. Okay, that's 2.064. Okay, so let's see what we have here now. Okay, so T is going to be equal to the difference between the two means in terms of standard errors. Okay, so that means it's going to be equal to X bar minus mu, the difference between the two means, over the standard error. Okay, so what is that? That's 260 minus 250 over the standard error, which is equal to three. 
Hey, what does that come out to be? That comes out to be 10 over 3 is equal to 3.33. Okay, so is our, is our key value greater than our critical value of t? Well, the answer to that, of course, is yes. So we can reject the null hypothesis that these two populations are the same. Okay, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit uh, uh, in order to, uh, now that we see the, the mechanism, the reason why we did this, really in the beginning, before we even really set this up, we would want to propose a, a pair of hypotheses, right? Our null hypothesis is that there's no difference between the two means. That, in other words, that mu1 is equal to mu2. Okay, in our case, mu for private schools is equal to mu for public schools. Okay, well, as it happens, we know what they mean for public schools are, it's 250. So we can also state this this way, mu for private schools is equal to 250. This is the assumption that we start out with, that there's no difference between the two of them. And our, no, our alternative hypothesis that we're trying to prove by demonstrating that we have a big enough T-score, our null hypothesis is that the mean for public schools is not equal to the mean for private, uh, to the private schools, not equal to the mean for public schools. Or you could also write it being public schools is not equal to 250, right? So since our T-score exceeds the critical value of T, we can say that we reject the null hypothesis, right, reject, and we accept the alternative hypothesis. Had our T-score come out to be, say, 2.01, well, our critical value of T was 2.06, that means that th this could occur more than 5% of the time, even if the two populations were the same. We could get a result uh, that uh, 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 would have this big a difference, right? If we took a sample like this. Okay, so in that case, we don't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. That doesn't mean we've proved the null hypothesis. It always all it means is, is that we failed to reject it. We failed to prove that they're different. Okay, so uh, there's two possible outcomes here. Either we fail to reject the null hypothesis, or we reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so does that make sense to you guys? You guys at least a little bit comfortable with that. No, that's exactly the point. You have not proved that the null is true. All you've proved, all that means is that you didn't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. Let's say that the that, that you, you calculated your T-score and it was 2.063. Whoa, 2.063. That's like so close to what you would need to reject the null hypothesis. It's almost like you would say to yourself, gee, I, I really kind of proved, you know, I really kind of could say I reject the null hypothesis. So that's like the opposite, having that extreme of difference between the two of them, really the opposite of proving, you know, coming anywhere as near uh, demonstrating that the uh, two means are the same, right? So no, the whole point here is, is that this is a mechanism for you to show with a certain level of certainty, less than 5% chance of being wrong, that you can demonstrate that the two means are different. And that's important to us in, in, in public health, right? Because when you do a drug test, you want to make sure that, that, that you can prove with a certain level of certainty that the drug uh, is effective, that it performs better than a placebo does. Uh, that an intervention, a training program uh, uh, performs, people come out of a training program perform better than people who did not get the training or who got different training and so on and so forth. So proving a difference is really most of the time what we're trying to do here. Okay, so let me just go over uh, quickly proportions. Now, the other thing is, is that, look, before I go any further with this, the other thing is, is that notice that when I got a big difference in uh, uh, with the null hypothesis, when I, got, when, when I got a big difference in the T-score, right, much more than I needed to exceed the critical value of T, that suggests that there's less than a 5% chance, like maybe there's only a 1% chance, or maybe there's only a 0.001% chance that, that uh, I would get this result if the null hypothesis were true. Maybe I even went 
even beyond 5% chance of being wrong, even its lower level of being wrong, that's called a p-value, a p-value or significance. And um, it's a little difficult to deal to predict that with the chart that we have, because the chart is really just geared towards accepting or rejecting the null hypothesis. It only has the values for 95, 99, and so on and so forth. But when we use statistical software, we can actually, the statistical software like SPSS will actually not only give us a T-score that we can compare to a critical value, it'll actually give us the P-value or significance, right? So that you can see how likely it is. In other words, it only is it exactly 5% or 4% or is it 1% chance that you would be wrong if you reject a hypothesis? Okay, so obviously, if you don't, if, so in this case where we did not reject a null hypothesis because we didn't see T critical, the P value is bigger than 5.05. .05. In this case, where it was 3.0, 3.33, the P value was way less than 0.05, right? Because that number was so much bigger than 2.064. We'll see that when we try an example with SPSS. Okay, so let me uh, close this. I just wanna do a quick uh, confidence interval using proportions. Okay, so Mayor de Blasio is down in North Carolina and he's trying to decide whether he should run for president or not. Uh, it's interesting that, that um, uh, 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 everybody, uh, 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 New Yorkers think he shouldn't run for president, but he's pretty popular down in North Carolina for some reason. But at any rate, that's a whole other thing. So I'm gonna say, He's interested, his pollsters are interested in knowing whether um, uh, he would win uh, uh, in North Carolina if he were running in North Carolina. What percentage of voters would uh, be interested in voting? So let's say his pollsters go out and they take a sample of size 1000, right? Now he wants to know, gee, when I go into the primary, I want to know that I'm going to have more than 50% of the vote. I want my P value to be greater than 50%, right? So I wanna figure out whether or not my p-value is big enough that I exceed 50% of the vote and I can win the primary down there. So okay, so he goes and then it's hosts a uh, uh, poll, uh, poll, a thousand people, and he finds out that 530 people out of that thousand are gonna vote for him, right? Okay, very doubtful, but that's what, that's what they find out for our example here. So what is our p-value here? Well, notice this is a sample, right? It's not a population, it's a sample. Population number of voters there is probably millions, right? So, so this sample, the proportion of people that are gonna, that say in, the, in this uh, poll that are gonna vote for him are 500, 0.530, 0.53, 53%, 50, I mean, 30 out of a thousand. So that's the proportion. Well, now he wants to know, gee, Okay, here's my null hypothesis. My null hypothesis is, is that P, the percentage of people that are going to vote for the no, nope, not a cap, just P, percentage of people that are going to vote for uh, de Blasio uh, is equal to 50% or the percentage of people is not equal to 50%. Actually, he really wants to know greater than, but I'm going to phrase it this way for now. Okay, so now, the percentage we actually calculated is called P cap, right? P, remember, remember when we phrase a null hypothesis, we always use the uh, 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 mu, P, uh, sigma, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, when we're talking about the mean, uh, the mean of a sample, X bar, mean of the uh, uh, proportion, that sample proportion, we use P cap and we we'll use standard error and so on. Okay, so now, Let's see what our confidence interval, based on this, what is our confidence interval? Uh, we got a, we see that of a thousand people, we got a, a, a proportion of 53% say they're gonna uh, vote for him, but what does that mean in terms of the entire population? What is P equal to, right, for the entire population? Okay, well, we need to calculate a confidence interval. So our confidence interval is gonna be just like before, P plus or minus, well, T, we could either use T or Z. With proportions, you're almost always dealing with a very large sample size. So often you just default to using Z for this special case, 
right? So Z for alpha is equal to 0.05, right? For 95% confidence, in other words, times the standard error. Okay, so what is our proportion, our P cap that we calculated? It's 0.53. So let's see what this tells us about the true population proportion that might vote for him. Plus or minus for 95% confidence interval, use 1.96 times a standard error. Now what's our standard error equal to for proportions? Our standard error for proportions is equal to the square root of P times one minus P over the sample size. Okay, so what is that equal to? That's equal to the square root of 0.53 times 0.47 over 1,000. Okay, so let's calculate that. What is that equal to? Let's clear this out. Clear the memory. Okay, so 0.53 times 0.47 is equal to this divided by 1,000 is equal to this. And I'm going to find the square root of that whole thing. That's equal to 0 0.0157, 0 0.0156 almost. Right? So I'm not going to round that off. I'm going to leave that here just as it is. If I had to round it off, I'd say 0 0.0158. I keep at least three digits there, maybe. Right? 0 0.0158. Right? And, but I can actually just put this into memory. Let me clear the old memory. Put that into memory. Now I can actually, before I put it into memory, What's the next thing I'm going to do with this number? Let's see, 158.0158. I say, I just want to write it in here so I don't forget it. 0 0.0158. Right. What's the next thing I'm going to do with this? I'm going to multiply it by 1.96. So my confidence interval is going to be 0.53 plus or minus my margin of error, which is equal to what is my margin of error equal to? Let's go back here. Okay, which is, that's our standard error, times 1.96. And I come up with 0 0.031, right, roughly. So I'm going to clear out memory, and I'm going to put this number into memory. That's my margin of error. Whoops, let me clear it again. Put it in. Okay, so that's my margin, 0 .0, 0 0.031. So it's 0.53. Plus or minus 0.031. Okay, so I'm going to go back here and actually do this calculation. I'm going to, uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to clear this and I'm going to say 0.53 minus our margin of error. That comes out to be 0 0.499. 0 0.499. And 0.53 plus our margin of error comes out to be 0.56. Oops. Okay, so we're 95% sure. All right, we're 95% sure that the true population mean P for North Carolinians is that between 49.9% and 56% are going to vote for de Blasio. Well, does that mean that we're 95% sure he would win? Well, no, because there is, because 50% is inside of his confidence interval range. So we could get a result of 50% more than 5% of the time. So we're not 95% sure that he would win. Okay, so, so that's one of the ways you might use confidence interval. Another way is to set up a t-test. t is equal to p cap minus p over the standard error, just like you did before. So what is p cap? p cap, what came out to be uh, a 0.53, minus P for the population that we're thinking of, 50. 0.50 over standard error, which is equal to 
point one two zero one five eight point zero one five eight. I think, right? Am I right about that? Yes, I think I am. So what does that come out to? What's our what is our T score in our T test? In our T test, uh, our T score is going to be. Let me make calculator back up. Okay, 0.53 minus 0 0.50 equals 0 0.03 divided by 0 0.0158 equals 1.8, I'm going to call that 1.90. 0.1, uh, that's our T, that's our T value. What's our critical value of T for 95% for alpha is equal to 0.05 when we use the Z score? What is our critical value of, of T when we use the when we're using the, the, the Z score when it's a large, large sample? Our critical value is 1.96. Have we exceeded our critical value of T that we need to exceed to reject the null hypothesis here? The answer to that is no. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis in this case also. Okay, we can't say with 95% certainty that he's going to score 50% or more of the vote. Okay, that makes sense to you guys. Is there a minimal sample number to Z over T? Uh, I, I, I would only use it for proportions and uh, most likely uh, in in exams, I will give you a, a sample size that will probably make it big enough that you wouldn't likely have any issue with it, like a thousand people or something like that. Uh, if you're using uh, when you normally use the T, when you normally are doing work with a sample, you should probably always use the T test. One point nine six was the, uh, the value for, for a, a very large sample size. Remember, if we look at the T table, when, the, when, the, uh, when you were dealing with a very large sample size, right? The, the value for 95% confidence, right? Or alpha is equal to 0.05. The value for that became very close to 1.96, which is the same thing that it would be for the T table. Right. Where does all this come from? Well, from the from our normal standard normal distribution, we know that if we took samples over and over and over again, we would expect that 95% of the sample results would be between one negative 1.96 standard deviations below and positive 1.96 standard deviations above the mean. Right. So we would expect only two and a half percent of the samples be out on either side. In other words, only 5% chance of getting a sample mean that's outside of that range. That's where that number comes from. That's where that z-score comes from. And the reason why the t-test is larger, t-scores are usually are always larger for uh, uh, one of these analyses, is because the t-distribution is wider. So you always need a larger difference like minus 2.064 uh, in the example we did before for a sample size of 25 uh, to the left or to the right in order to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so let's try a, a few more examples here. Okay, and uh, the other thing I wanted to emphasize, and again, this came up yesterday, is when we do a confidence interval, the confidence interval tells us that we're 95% certain that the true population mean is between these two numbers. It also means that uh, that if we repeated this study over and over again for sample size 25, we would expect that 95% of the time that we would capture the true population mean between the upper and lower ranges of our confidence interval. Okay, so in other words, if we did this study exactly this way 20 times, we would expect that we would capture the population mean 19 times and we would miss it one time. We would be wrong when we say that it's uh, within that range one time. Okay, 4A, I got to 
that's I would certainly do that if I had any idea what 4A was. I'm going to go to 4A. I'm going to go there right now. And we'll take a look at it. While we're there, I want to take a quick look at the discussions boards if anybody's added any questions there. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. And assignment. That was assignment. That was assignment. I, I can get to it here, I think. That was assignment. Oops. Uh, let's see. Question one and assignment four A. Okay. Okay. I'm going to start as if I'm taking it. Uh, question one: You wish to test whether the number of fouls called in the regular season games is different than the NCAA tournament. Uh, 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 the mean number of fouls called during all regular season is mu is equal to 40.1. Uh, people keep st the statistics on all kinds of stuff, right? So in this case, they know how many fouls were called average for every game during the regular season. This, all the colleges, even the ones that didn't make it, there's millions of them, right? Um, uh, into the, uh, the 64, uh, there's millions of them. And but the average number of fouls called per game is 40.1. Notice mu, that's a population mean. Okay, so now you don't have the resources to compare whether more or fewer fouls are called in the playoff games. But you know, you can tune in, you decide I'm going to randomly watch 16 games out of the uh, 64. That 30, there's 32, 64 teams, there's 32 games, and there's 16 games. And so you're not going to have time to watch all of them. So you're going to randomly select 16 games. You're going to watch them and count how many files. And you find that the mean number of files in the 16 games that you watch, sample size is 16, the mean number of files is 38.1. And the standard deviation in those 16 games is 5.8. So look past all of these smoke and mirrors there. And what you wind up seeing is, is that you have a population that is known that you want to compare to, right? So the population mu, mu is equal to 40.1. That's regular season, mu regular season, right? So mu uh, po uh, postseason is unknown. You don't know what that is for all of the games. You only sample 16 games. So what did you do? You took sample size of 16. You found that the mean not mu, but x bar is equal to 38.1. And you found that the standard deviation was equal to 5.8 fouls. So now that you know the sample size and you know the standard deviation, you can calculate a standard error. So you want to use a t, you're going to use a t test to count. Uh, well, first, I think it asks you to calculate 95% confidence into the uh, mean number of uh, fouls. Okay. So let's do that. So the standard error is equal to 5.8 divided by the square root of the sample size, which is 4. Clear? Clear. 5.8 divided by 4 is equal to 1.45. One point four five. Okay, is everybody with me there up to that point? Yes. I, 
Oh, thanks for the help there on the 95 percent there. Um, uh, the sample uh, standard error is equal to 1.45. Okay, good. We're all on the same page. So now I want to calculate the confidence interval. I want to predict what the postseason mean is. I don't know what it is. All I know is ex, uh, what the average is for my sample. So my confidence interval for that cat to, to that mean is going to be x bar plus or minus. Okay, so now a sample size of 16, a uh, small sample, sample size 16, confidence interval. I need a t-score for 15 degrees of freedom. So I'm going to go to the table. I'm going to look up 15 degrees of freedom. And the t-score I'm going to use, notice it's a, it's a smaller sample, so it's a lot bigger this time. T is going to be equal to 2.131. Is equal to 2.131 times the standard error, which is 1.45. Everybody with me up to that point? Okay, I'm actually going to write down in here, I'm going to write down 38.1 plus or minus. Okay, and I'm going to calculate what the margin of error is. It's 1.45 times. 2.131. So our margin of error is equal to 3.3.1, 3 3.09. Let's say. So I'm going to clear memory, add this to memory, and that's going to be 3.09. I'm going to put in there. Plus or minus 3.09. Ah. Okay. So now I have to add and subtract 3.09. From 38.1. 38.1 minus 3.09 is equal to 35.01. And the upper range is going to be, the upper limit is going to be 38. Point one plus that margin of error. It's going to be equal to 41.2 to 41.19. Okay, so I am 95% sure that the true population, the true population proportion, the true population mean for the number of fouls called in the playoff games is between 35 and 41, right? And what do we say it was? It was 40 in the, uh, uh, um, in the uh, uh, regular season. And you know, since 40 is inside of my confidence interval, I really can't say with 95% certainty that it's different, can I? Right, if it had been, if the regular season had been 45, you could have said, oh, well, look how narrow this range is. Here, look how much it is during regular season. Really looks like it's really different. If we were going to do a T test here, we would say mu for the playoffs uh, playoff season is equal to mu for the regular season. And uh, 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 we could also say mu for the playoff season. Since we know the mu for the regular season is 40.1, we could just write in that number if we want. And our alternative hypothesis would be mu for the playoff season is not equal to mu for the regular season. Or in other words, mu for the playoff season is not equal to 40.1. Well, based on what I see here, we should reject the null hypothesis for this H0 and H alt. Let's do that t-test right now. So that t-test is going to be equal to, is going to be equal to x bar minus mu over the standard error. So t is going to be equal to, first of all, t critical, t critical for 14 degrees of freedom and 5% chance of being wrong, 95% chance of likelihood of being right. t critical is equal to 2.31. We looked that up, oh, 3.131. 2.131. So that's our critical value of t. Let's see if we exceed it. Okay, x bar is equal to uh, 38.1 minus 40.1, 38.1, right, uh, 40, divided by 
1.45 hour standard error. So that's going to be 2 divided by 1.45. So my t value, number standard errors difference between these two means, is equal to 2 divided by 1.45. Or five is equal to 1.38, and a T score of 1.38 does not exceed my T critical. So I fail to reject my null hypothesis. Okay. Again, if the difference had been 38.1 to 45.1, that would have been a difference of seven over 1.41 would have been something like four or something like that, right? And four T T equal to four would be much bigger than our T-critical, and we would have rejected the null hypothesis. This is all about how far apart are these two means, the sample mean and the population mean. Not in terms of the actual numbers that they're apart, like the 38 and 40, but in terms of the number of standard deviations or standard errors in this case that they are apart. Okay, that's really what we're after here. Okay, so let me give you a couple more examples. Yeah, matter of fact, before I go too far, I want to demonstrate this using SPSS because there will be either a, a, a problem where we have to use SPSS or possibly just that, uh, that way to interpret a table in SPSS. So I uploaded into the practice exam practice area some some uh, various examples tables. One second, let me find one here. Okay, where did I put this? Double click this one. Let's, there it is. There we go. Okay, so here's, here's a quick example here. Not exactly a public health example, but I wonder if I got the right, if I just opened the right thing. Yeah, I think I did. Oh, no, I didn't open the right thing. Okay, we'll try it again. Yeah, I don't want that. Oh, okay, that'll work. I don't want that data set though. Okay, hang on a second. Okay, so here's an example. A car company claims that their uh, that their new Tesla, their new super electronic. Uh, battery operated solar uh, vehicle. Ah. Save the contents now. I don't want to save that. Okay, good. And I don't really need this right now. A uh, car company claims that their uh, sedan averages 31 miles per gallon. That's their claim. That's what they say is true for all of their vehicles. An average, all of their vehicles altogether average 31 miles per hour. So that, in a sense, is a uh, is a, a mean, population mean. Okay. You randomly select, you want to test that and see if that's really true. You randomly select eight of these cars, randomly select eight cars, and you test their mileage. And this is the result that you get 30, one of them gives you 30 miles per gallon, one gives you 30, 28, 32, 26, 33, and so on and so forth. Does the actual mileage from these cars deviate from 31 miles per gallon? In other words, is it really true or is the actual mileage different than what they claim it to be? Okay, so how can I put that in terms of uh, how we structure our t-test? Okay, so let's see what we have here. We have a claim that the true mean is equal to 31 miles per gallon. Okay, now to test that, we're gonna take a sample and then that, that sample size is equal to eight. And it turns out that the mean that we get from that sample was 30, I think, was, oh, we don't know what it is yet. We don't know what it is yet. We don't know what the standard deviation is yet. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, let's actually do that using Excel. Where's Excel here now? Gonna get back to my window. Okay, here we go. I'm going to open this up. Do I have it in Excel? Yeah, I have it in Excel. I'm going to open this up in Excel. 
So these are these eight numbers in Excel. There's another question for a whose answer is none of the above. Can you reject my hypothesis or fail to reject my that mean? So here. Um, I'll, tell, I'll tell you what, as soon as I get done with this, I will take a look at that. Let me know if you know what number it is. Okay, so here is here, here are numbers as we found before. So X bar, X bar, the mean, the, uh, the average for a sample is equal to the average of these numbers. X bar, the average is 29. So I see it's a little bit different than the guy claimed, right? And our standard deviation is equal to, oops. Standard deviation is equal to 2.77. Our sample size is equal to eight. Okay, and what is our standard error? Our standard error is equal to, it's equal to standard deviation divided by the square root of our sample size. Oh, this is fighting it here for something. Which is equal to 0.918. Okay, so let's do our t-test here. So what, first of all, number one, this is a small sample. This is a sample of size eight seven degrees of freedom. So what is our critical value of T going to be? Well, I have to go to my table for that, don't I? Well, let's see if I can't find my table. So for eight, sample size eight, seven degrees of freedom, our critical value of T for alpha is equal 0.05 or for 95%, uh, critical value of T is 2.365. Critical value of T is 3.2.365. Five. So we need to exceed that. Our T value has to exceed that. So let's calculate T. T is equal to X bar, our sample mean, minus our population mean, divided by our standard error. Okay, this is really in parentheses up here. Let's go ahead and calculate what T is equal to. T is equal to, it's equal to uh, 29 minus, uh, what was it again, 31, 31, divided by the standard error. Okay, that's what T is equal to. It's equal to 2.568. Okay, so now T, our value of T is 2.568. Remember the negative or positive doesn't mean anything. Those are only testing to see if it's greater than the distance that we need. And we, uh, our null hypothesis here, in the problem, they didn't ask you to prove it was less or more. They just asked you to show that uh, mean mileage, the mean uh, uh, mileage, uh, the mean mileage is uh, equal to 31, or the mean mileage is not equal to 31, right? So, that's our null hypothesis. And this is our alternative hypothesis. Okay. So our T-score that we calculate, number standard errors apart, is 2.7, about 2.7. What? How far apart did they need to be for us to reject the null hypothesis? Well, that's our T-critical. They need to be 2.365 standard errors apart. In fact, at 2.56 standard errors apart. So we reject the null hypothesis and we accept the alternative hypothesis that this guy's all this guy's full of, full of it. He did, his cars don't get 35, 31 miles to the gallon. Okay, now I'm going to do this again. And I'll get to this question four that you asked me about in just a second. I'm going to do this same problem again in SPSS. Okay, I have the data set available to me. I'm going to say open data. Okay, I have it in that, that same folder that we were looking at before. Here's our mileage claim folder. And there it is, SAV file. I'm gonna open it. And here is our data. Okay, as we just as we saw, miles per gallon. Uh, if I go to this side, I can see 
It's a scalar variable, a numeric variable. It's, my, it's uh, MPG, it's mileage. And I'm gonna calculate these descriptive statistics I did just now. Analyze descriptive statistics. And I'm gonna go down to uh, uh, descriptives. And I'm gonna say, okay, move my MPG into the variables box I wanna work with. And options, I'm gonna ask it to find the variance, the standard error, uh, the mean, and so on and so forth, like the standard deviation. Let's find all those things. Say OK and OK. The output window will pop up. OK, and let's see what we have here. Well, our mean is 29, just the same thing we found before. Our standard deviation was 2.777, same thing we found when we used Excel. Our standard error is 0.982, same thing that we found when we used uh, Excel as well. Now, Let's, let's calculate a confidence interval. I'm going to analyze descriptive statistics. This time I'm going to go down to instead of descriptives to explore. I'm going to move miles per gallons into the dependence list. And in statistics, I'm going to tell, oh, give me a confidence interval, the mean of 95%. And I'm going to click OK. And just as we did before with that homework number one, it comes up, tells me the mean is 29, same numbers we got before, right? Our uh, uh, minimum standard deviation is the same. Uh, our standard error is in here somewhere, if everything here somewhere. And look at the 95% confidence interval. 2.26.68 to 31.32 is the upper bound. So it comes out with the same, uh, no, I think it comes out with the same numbers. Do we get a different number than that? Where's Excel? I got to keep credit that. What did I, oh, I didn't calculate the confidence interval, did I? That's kind of odd. Let's see. T critical is this. Okay, let me go on to the T test now. Analyze. Okay, so that's how I want to run a T test. I want to compare means. So I'm going to click up here to analyze. I'm going to go down to compare means. I see you got questions there. I'll get to them in a second. Compare means. And this is gonna be a single sample t-test. As we move on in the semester, we're gonna to go to two sample, paired sample, so on and so forth. For now, we're only dealing with single sample t-tests. So in this case, I'm gonna take the average for miles per gallon, that's my test variable, and compare it to the value of the mean of the population that I'm comparing it to, which happened to be 31. I'm gonna click OK, and it will actually do that t-test for us. If I go down here, here's our t-test, and our, actually, I made a mistake. I guess I made a mistake here. Our T is, uh, let me see, X bar minus, minus two, that's two. Two divided by 0.98. Standard error. That looks right. Standard deviation, what did I come up with standard deviation here? Let me look at my output table here. Let me just catch up to this and see what I what, why it is a difference in 2.77. is the standard deviation. And the standard error was 9.82. Good, that sounds right. Okay. And let's see. The difference was 29. Twenty-nine. Oh, I'm sorry. Were we comparing it to the number 30 or 31? I don't remember anymore. Where is it? Let's see. Let me find. Let me find uh, the Word document to make sure we got this right. Oh, no, 31, we're comparing it to 31. I got all these numbers. 31, okay, alpha is equal to 0.05, that's right. So it's two divided by this. This is equal to 29 minus 31 over the standard error. Two divided by that. That doesn't look right. Oh, I know what it is. I need to put this in parentheses. I believe. 
Maybe that's what the problem is. Yep. Come on. Let me do this. Ah, there we go. I forgot to put that in parentheses. Okay, our T score is 2.03. Our critical value of T is 2.365. So we failed to reject the null hypothesis because we did not exceed our T value. Got to be careful with it when you use Excel with these parentheses, right? But uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that if you were doing it by hand, you would probably never make that mistake, right? So it's 29, it's two divided by 0.98. You could tell that it's going to be almost exactly two. Turns out to be 2.03, right? And that's well below our critical value of T. So if you look at SPSS, SPSS wasn't able to get that wrong, right? Because it's a computer. And I noticed as soon as it gave us a result, we had a problem here, right? So what's our outcome here? Our outcome is, is that the T value, got the, the confidence interval is 26.68 to 31.32. 31 is inside of its confidence interval. So it's hard to tell that it's really different. The two means, you know, may be the same, who knows? We can't say with 95% certainty that they're different. But on the other hand, let's do a T test. We do our two T tests and the value of T comes out to be 2.037, seven degrees of freedom. Okay, so that 2.037, that 2.037 tells us that we're smaller than the critical value of T that we need for uh, a, 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 to be able to reject the null hypothesis with less than 5% chance of being wrong. How do I know that? Because I know we looked up what the critical value of T was for seven degrees of freedom. It isn't in this table. You don't see it in this table, correct? So instead, what SPSS tells us is, well, here's your T value. You could go look it up in the critical, in the T table, what the critical value is for this degrees of freedom, but you don't really have to bother because not only am I gonna give you this information, but I'm gonna give you the exact probability that you are wrong if you reject the null hypothesis. That, that you would get this extreme of value, this big a difference between the two means if the null hypothesis were true. In other words, it really was, they really were both, 30, should have been 31 miles per gallon. Okay, what's the probability of that occurring? It's 8%, 0.081, And what is our tolerance for error? It's only, it's gotta be less than 5%. So since this significance is greater than 0.05, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Had this significance been, this been less than 0.05, we would have said, well, there's less than 5% chance that, that uh, we would get this extreme a, a difference, this big a T-score, if the null hypothesis were true. So we're rejecting the null hypothesis. In this case, it tells us this and the critical value of T, and this compared to 0.05, both tell us we failed to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, the questions. There's another question. Okay, let me hang on a second here. Let me work backwards on the questions here. Uh, if, a, if sigma two tails less than 0.05, uh, suppose we fail to reject the null. Uh, da, 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 uh, that's right. If, no, no. If, if sigma is less than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. In other words, there's less than 5% chance. Uh, you know, it's re, statisticians don't like this kind of phrasing. There's less than 5% chance we would be wrong if we reject the null hypothesis. In this case, there's less than 8% chance we would be wrong, but it's not enough. We want to be less than 5%. So we want that number to be less than 5%, less than 0.05, before we reject the null hypothesis. If it's above 0.05, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And you'll always find that the T that, that that in cases where this is greater than 0.05, then the, this value of T is less than the critical value. You haven't exceeded the critical value and you're not less than 0.05, they go together. Okay, so uh, the other question for us, uh, da, 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 da. there's a question for, uh, whose answer is none of the above in regards to rejecting all hypo, uh, that meant to accept the alternative hypothesis. Yeah? Confusing to me, type one, type two, also. Uh, power, I don't think you have to worry about for this test. We'll be getting to that. Power and sample size and so on and so forth. Um, uh, 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 I, I, I think 
Um, for this exam, I don't think that that'll be a big issue. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll check. I'll post something in the morning if I think there's something uh, that might wind up on uh, power. I have to look back, look back at our examples and PowerPoints to see what we covered. Um, so let me see. Okay, question four. Question four. Do you got? You have any? I mean, uh, another question in, uh, four. Yeek. So which one would that be? Data. Ba, ba, ba. Let's see. Let's see if there's. A, oh, here we go. Okay. Based on your calculated value of t and the critical value of t for alpha is equal to 0.05, 15 degrees of freedom, which conclusion below is most appropriate? Uh, let's see. Reject, reject the alternative hypothesis. We never do. We don't reject the null alternative. That doesn't make any sense, right? We only reject the, the null hypothesis. Accept the null hypothesis. We never do that, right? We don't. We don't accept the null hypothesis. We only Fail to reject the no. Uh, fail to reject the alternative hypothesis, right? Fail to reject it, or we accept, uh, or or we uh, or we reject the null no hypothesis. We don't accept the null no hypothesis, and we don't reject the alternative hypothesis. Reject the null no hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. You know, I I I can't answer that question for you. It depends on what the result of your test is here. In other words, I, I, did I use the same data they have here? So you guys remember, did you guys, anybody remember if the T value was bigger than T critical for this example? Anybody recall that? Was, was the T score, the T value bigger than T critical for our sample of 16 here? The T, the T value we calculated was bigger, that means we reject the null hypothesis and we accept the alternative hypothesis. Had the T score not been bigger than T critical for 15 degrees of freedom, well, then none of these would be correct, right? Because we would have just said that we failed to reject the null hypothesis. Then that would have been a none of the above. Okay, is there another one with none of the above? Then maybe, maybe I got the wrong one. Okay, look at this one down here. This one down here, would we, uh, would we reject the null hypothesis in, in the case of this chart? This output from SPSS, what do we do with the null hypothesis here? Do we, uh, do we uh, reject the null hypothesis except the alternative or do we fail to reject the null hypothesis? Those are two possibilities. Fail to reject the null or reject the null and accept the alternative. So what do we do here? What do you think? Well, the sample size is 59 and T is 2.5, right? So for, I'm sorry, 59 degrees of freedom, 59 degrees of freedom, uh, a critical value of T is 2.0. So it looks like we've exceeded the critical value of T, right? And we also got a significance of 0.015. Those two things, what do they tell us? Do they tell us to reject the null hypothesis or to fail to reject the null hypothesis? I'll wait for an opinion. I, I hope they, this delay is like an internet delay and not like everybody's falling asleep on me. We reject the null hypothesis exactly because you've exceeded the critical value of T for 59 degrees of freedom. It was only like 2.0 or something like that. And also, there's only a one and a half percent chance that you would be wrong if you reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so many ways to skin a cat here. We had a confidence interval, we had the T test, and so on and so forth. So uh, I think it's a good, this is a good spot to call it a night. Good luck, get to work on the uh, less than 0.05, we reject the uh, significance less than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis, yes. Okay, have a good night, get some rest. Um, uh, uh, get up early tomorrow, study for the exam. And uh, do me a favor, do real well on it, okay? I'm hoping that you guys do all do real well on it, okay? So have a good night, okay? I'll have this, I should have this up and uh, uh, this uh, uh, converted and up within about maybe two hours or so. Um, yeah, that's a good question. It's gonna be probably about 10, 12 short answers. And then it's probably gonna be maybe three 
or pro you know these problems on blackboard they kind of stretch out into a lot of you know sections because you can only put in one number at a time so but like maybe three or four problems of some kind oh excellent okay you, when you say you just built it you mean on excel or or uh, or uh, in a, uh, a portable in a la portable calculator on excel oh excellent very good that's good there are some functions for helping you do this in excel and there's also some uh, uh there's add-ons to excel in other words you can download and install additional statistical calculators and uh, 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 uh functions from excel from uh, microsoft's website i believe see it's a little hinky they, they used to uh, it used to be like uh, it's syntax language that was built into itself now i think it uses visual basic some of it works on all the machines some of it only windows 10 some only some doesn't work on a mac it's kind of like a little hinky and stuff so i stay away from encouraging students that might get confused by it that you know uh, uh, uh because they might have a version that doesn't have the functionality that other versions have so i stay away from just and i mostly use excel as a kind of a calculator rather than you know use the built-in functions like the key test function and so on uh, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that you've worked i love excel excel is a really great tool i'm glad to hear that you're uh, making it even more functional for yourself okay so good night guys and i'll see you guys tomorrow evening